The finale of Monarch Legacy of Monsters brings human-scale drama to a titanic monster story and succeeds way more than you may have expected. Here's how this chapter of the Monarch story wraps up. Monarch covers a lot of ground in its first season, but the story starts with a focus on Kate Randa and Kentaro Randa searching for their father Hiroshi. After discovering that he had two separate families in Tokyo and San Francisco, the newly discovered half-sibling set out with former Monarch member Lee Shaw and love interest May to find him. In the past, we see how a young Lee, Bill Randa, and Keiko Mira founded Monarch, and how Keiko vanished in a tragic Hollow Earth portal investigation. That tragedy informs everything that follows. Bill and Lee's respective obsessions, Hiroshi's orphaned upbringing, and the modern state of Monarch. In the next to last episode of the season, May, Kate, and Lee are pulled down into a midway point between the surface and the hollow earth known as Axis Mundi. There, Kate discovers Keiko still alive and well, believing that she had been in the wilderness for about two months. Due to the time dilation effects of the portals, she's oblivious that more than 50 years have passed and that she's missed what would have been most of her life. The reunion between Keiko and Lee in the Monarch season one finale is heartbreaking. Kate refrains from telling her grandmother her true identity or how much time has passed, but it all comes out when they run into May and Lee. Hiding behind a tree to conceal his aged face, Lee explains through tears the tragedy they've both fallen into. Keiko breaks down as well, but she quickly accepts the truth. Fortunately, the group is able to devise a plan of escape. Keiko was already using Lee's old Titan signal device to send a message to the surface. Together, they carry it to the old pod he used in 1962 to travel to Axis Mundi himself. They hook the device up and get it going, hoping that a Titan will open up the portal above them and carry them home. But when the nearest Titan ends up being both much closer and more aggressive than anticipated, things start to go south. Lee leaves the pod to fix the signal by hand, only to be caught in the crossfire when Godzilla appears. Amidst the Titan duel, he activates the device again. The pod is pulled into the portal and Lee chases after it, but he isn't fast enough. In a tragic mirror of Keiko's 1959 disappearance, he lets go of her hand, happy in a sacrifice after finally being able to keep his promise and bring her home. While May, Kate, Lee, and Keiko fight to escape from Axis Mundi, Kentaro is left on the surface to pick up the pieces. He gets kicked out of Monarch after his leg heals and is told to go back to his old life, accepting that his friends and family are dead. But after returning to Tokyo, he bumps into his father, the man he's been searching for since the beginning of the show. The reunion doesn't exactly go great. Kentaro berates Hiroshi for being a liar and an absent father, but it isn't until he says that Kate is dead that his father truly hears him. Hiroshi breaks down, devastated that his efforts to keep his children out of his business only led to their endangerment. When Tim shows up with evidence of Kate's survival, though, father and son agree to work together to bring her home. We learn in the final moments of Season 1 that they end up working with Apex, the same shady tech corporation that will later create Mechagodzilla and endanger the planet. Kate, Keiko, and May emerge two years after the incident in Kazakhstan, only to find themselves in an Apex facility on Skull Island. As Kong roars in the distance, May's old boss, Brenda Holland, emerges from the shadows. It seems that Monarch's repeated inaction prompted some, including Tim, to leave the organization and join Apex. This sets up the company's immense global power at the beginning of Godzilla vs. Kong. At the core of Monarch Legacy of Monsters are a couple of different love stories, and they come to the surface in the Season 1 finale. Down in Axis Mundi, Lee reunites with his beloved Keiko, but it's 50 years too late. Keiko! Keiko, is that really you? Of course it is! He's so grieved by the time he's lost and ashamed of his old face that he's scared to even look at her when they meet. At the same time, May and Kate find each other, brought closer by yet another wild adventure. Their feelings for each other have grown mutual and strong. Back on the surface, Hiroshi faces the consequences of his lies and infidelity. Kentaro's mother, Emiko, makes it clear that she no longer wants anything to do with him, but she emphasizes that he must maintain a relationship with her son. We also learn that Hiroshi is finalizing a divorce with Kate's mother, Caroline, in San Francisco. Were his scientific discoveries worth all the betrayals he made along the way? Looking at his face, it's hard to imagine he'd answer yes. Like his parents and Lee before him, Hiroshi fell into the trap of obsession, always assuming he'd have more time. At least for him, he still has a chance to make things right with his children and show how much he's always loved them. Monarch seems to say that it's easy to put off the things that matter in life. Our work, our trauma, and at times our own self-loathing all work to keep us away from the relationships that make life worth living. Lee returns from his first Axis Monday venture and finds the world has passed him by. Out of guilt for losing Keiko and shame for missing Bill's death, he believes he deserves the imprisonment Monarch sentences him to. Meanwhile, Hiroshi has every opportunity to be present for his families and tell them the truth, but he avoids doing so. Perhaps he thinks himself unworthy of forgiveness or a happy life. As we're told in one of the flashback scenes of Episode 9, <laughs> It's a fact that's shown repeatedly throughout Season 1. When Keiko realizes that she, too, has lost so much time, she grieves the life she might have lived. 
She grieves her son's childhood and young adulthood, the death of Bill, and the many others she knew who lived and died in the 57 days she's been in Axis Monday. For her, the choice would have been easy. She would have given up all her scientific adventures if it meant being there with Hiroshi as he grew up. As Lee tells her, the world has changed, but not so dramatically. People are still the same, and it's the people who matter. Family secrets can do more than cause divisions. In some cases, unresolved issues can cause generational trauma, leaving people decades down the line to pick up the pieces. Keiko, Bill, and Lee's obsession with their investigations left Hiroshi without a family. When it came time for him to build a family of his own, he was scared the same thing would happen again. You can read his double life as a kind of desperate safety net. If anything were to happen to one family, at least he wouldn't lose everything. Or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe he stayed distant from everyone because he feared the pain of losing them, which is why he was never around for long. The final scene of Monarch Season 1 brings all of this complicated history to bear. After escaping Axis Monday, Kate finally reunites with her father, whom she's been searching for the entire show. He finally uses his brilliant mind to help his family rather than distance himself from them. When he sees his mother alive and well, looking exactly as she did when he was a boy, he collapses into her arms. Keiko had no control over the harm she indirectly brought on her son, but it's still enlightening to see how her return washes away decades of pain. It's as if all of the baggage Hiroshi has been carrying around with him suddenly fell from his shoulders. In that moment, life doesn't have to be painful anymore. Healing can finally begin. In addition to the human themes of family, grief, and regret, Monarch Legacy of Monsters has a larger message about the natural world and our relationship to it. The Titans may be fictional, but they still represent the planet. It's a world that humans have assumed dominion over, but which is far stranger and more awe-inspiring than most can accept. Kaiju have always been metaphors for the environment in cinema. They show what happens when we destroy it or pollute it with war. They embody the response of nature's self-preservational instinct to heal and rebuild. That metaphor has been present in the MonsterVerse since the start, but it feels more impactful in Monarch. When Kate, Lee, Keiko, and May are stranded on Axis Monday, they can't help but acknowledge their powerlessness. They feel out of place, knowing that this isn't a world built for them. The world isn't a thing humans can ever truly control, Monarch seems to say. We are a piece of it and no more. The power-hungry maneuvers of Apex Cybernetics stand in opposition to this idea. The company represents mankind's urge to subdue and assimilate nature, and its robotic advancements eventually challenge the natural order itself in Godzilla vs. Kong, leading to widespread destruction and death. Lee Shaw gets a pretty complete arc in Monarch. He begins as a cocky, sexist American soldier meets Keiko and overcomes his biases. He starts to believe in the mission of protecting the innocent, but experiences great loss in the process. He lives decades in shame and guilt, and then finally has a chance to make some of his mistakes right. When he forces Keiko to let him go so she can escape back to the surface at the end of Season 1, he's almost laughing. Hey, what are you doing? My job. What are you doing back here? Even 60 years later, he hasn't forgotten his promise to keep her safe. Lee is happy to make the sacrifice, but that doesn't mean he's dead. If Keiko could survive an Axis Monday for so long, he might still be alive. We know that years of surface time are just a matter of days in Axis Monday, so we wouldn't need to hold out long before rescue might come. Maybe by the time he gets back, Keiko will have grown old and the story will give them a long-awaited happily ever after. The other big question at the end of Monarch Season 1 is about Axis Monday itself. We're told by Keiko that it isn't truly the hollow Earth, but rather a middle point between the realm of the Titans and the surface. But how does that work exactly? In Godzilla vs. Kong, a team of Monarch and Apex operatives follow Kong down a portal into the hollow Earth, but they don't get a chance to linger in the strange lightning forest. The natural answer is simply that the portal network beneath the Earth's crust is far more complicated than we previously thought. It's not just a subway line between the surface and the hollow Earth, but a confusing web of ever-changing tunnels with multiple exit points. Keiko notes that the ecosystem of Axis Mundi is a blend of surface flora and hollow Earth life. Since it seems easier to access from both places, that makes sense. I don't think this is a realm of the Titans at all. It's a place between places. It's also worth noting that Axis Mundi has some key characteristics that separate it from the Hollow Earth. As far as we know, there's no temporal distortion in the Hollow Earth, as the humans in Godzilla vs. Kong journey between the two realms in one-to-one -one time. Also, the gravity inversion of the Hollow Earth, the aspect of the realm that prohibits humans from reaching it for so long, doesn't exist in Axis Mundi. For now, there are still a lot of questions about how these different places connect and relate to one another. With luck, Monarch will get a Season 2 to explore those ideas further. For co-creator Matt Fraction, the complex theme of inheritance was a guiding principle from the start. Fraction told Men's Health, There's a recurring theme in the work I do that I like stories about people deciding to accept their inheritance or reject it. Children being the parents of adults and all that kind of stuff. 
Director Matt Shackman echoed the sentiment in an interview with The Verge, saying the project appealed to him because it was a multi-generational family story. Because MonsterVerse fans know what happens later in the movies, the story of Monarch had to stay grounded in the human characters. In the end, that's what makes the emotional payoffs of Season 1 so satisfying. Thematically, the show's creators were also tuned into the historical significance of kaiju cinema. Co-creator Chris Black told MovieWeb, Godzilla and the kaiju of the MonsterVerse have always been sort of existential allegories for whatever the threat is. And then, if you're looking at our modern age, I think you could pick. Obviously, climate change and global warming is a very real and current issue. Kurt Russell was also interested in the project because of its larger thematic implications, revealing to Entertainment Tonight, I was probably, I don't know, maybe eight years old when I first saw Godzilla. And that was an image that I never forgot. What I love about sci-fi is great sci-fi is an opportunity to examine some huge philosophical questions. 